On November 10th, 1982, after almost 20 years in power over the Soviet Union, the leader who was leading the um, Soviet Union through the Cold War, Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev, died. The day of the funeral, which was a big deal for that time for the Soviet Union, then matter for the whole world, it was broadcasted by all three channels in Soviet Union and television. I remember the broadcast. And Victoria Brezhnev, his wife, quietly stood by the casket, saying nothing. Both in his and her life, they were atheists, and there were examples of communist party. Faith was nowhere to be found in their lives. Faith was seen as a weakness. They were encouraging the nation to trust in themselves. And no one with any government position would be aspiring to any Christian faith. Yet, she was standing by the casket and at the very last moment, when the soldiers touched the lid, they wanted to put the lid over the dead body. She leaned to her dead body, husband uh, body, and she made a sign of a cross. That was unprecedented. Why would she do that? There at the center of atheist empire, she traced the image of hope. That there is hope beyond grave. Hope that there was more hope than an atheist teachings. And she has done that because she has some trust in hope that there is possible that Christ may save her husband beyond the grave. That was the recollection of Mrs. Mr. Bush who was witnessing the funeral. When we say we're hoping for something, what are you hoping for? You know, that nothing is in our life is really guaranteed. Nothing. You may hope that you will wake up tomorrow, but you do not know. That's not warranted. You may hope that you're going to pay off your house, but it's not guaranteed. You may hope that your kids would walk with the Lord, but that's not guaranteed. You may hope that you will retire and do many things at your retirement, but that's not guaranteed. Scripture never guarantees those things, but Scripture guarantees life after death who trusted in Christ. That's the only word that we have in Scripture. And so we come today to the book of Isaiah, who instilled this hope to the nation that is under severe oppression and lives in the darkness. That even though they have not seen freedom, and even though they have not seen the prosperity, and even though have not seen the promised king, the king is coming. And he will reign over them with justice, and mercy, and love. At the heart of the messianic hope, reflected in the New Testament, it is the expectation of king that linked to David's dynasty, the anointed Christ, the Messiah, who would be son of David. The grounds of these expectations are firmly rooted in the Old Testament, where the Davidic dynasty was promised by God that the story would continue even if every one of those unrighteous kings will fail. This is the expectation that God will send 
a unique king from the David's loins. He will bring God's blessings of peace to the nation, but in first place to Israel. That was the hope of Israel. Jeremiah 49 says, Hope of Israel, its savior in time of distress. I call this passage, Finding Hope in Hopeless Times. The fullness expression of this Davidic hope in the pre-exilic period comes in the book of Isaiah as we see. And we see in chapter 9 these familiar verses. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Here in Isaiah, we are encountering an amazing story of hope and peace promised to Israel and then to the whole world. Let's read this passage together. Chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. This is where we're going to spend the rest of our times. Isaiah chapter 9. And as you read and as we go through, you will see that this chapter and Isaiah in general is dealing far more with the second coming of Jesus than with his birthday. It was kind of a little bit of surprise to us as we studied that we wanted to bring it at the Christmas celebration. And yet, we can't help it but explain the text, what the text says, and the text points to the hope of Israel at the second coming. Chapter 9, but there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier time, he treaded the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Now, here's the description. Just feel it. Feel it as if you are there, as if you're there right now, and you are those Israelites and live in a land of Naphtali and Zebulun. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence and with the gladness of harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden. And the staff on their shoulders. The rod of their oppressor as in the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult. And clock rolled in blood will be for burning. Fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. I want you to walk out today with an encouraged heart that there is time for you when you will embrace your Lord and all that he promised, all the things that you have not received yet, you will receive it together with Israel. Our hope for future is reinforced by trusting in two things. You want to be more hopeful? We must trust in God's promises, number one, and God's plan. God's promises and God's plan. The point number one from verses one to five is this. And I try to make it a little bit more practical for us. Because we could talk about Israel, but what is it to us and for us? And here's the thought. No matter how desperate the situation may be, no matter how dark the time you're experiencing right now, God is calling us to trust his promises. And even if you don't receive them now, 
the promises are coming. And an, an, an example of Israel will see that these people have received this promise in the very, very dark times. You see, verse chapter 9, verse 1 says, but there will be no more gloom. That means that there was a gloom and there was anguish at the earliest times. And God is promising to Israel that to those who live in the shadow of death, there is promise of light. Darkness here, gloom, characterized the region of Galilee. When Isaiah was speaking to them, we need to go back and look at the situation, geopolitical situation. What has happened? What were they living? Now, if you remember, if you flip back at chapter 7, this is where we find the promise of Messiah first time given to Israel. You might remember this, that Isaiah come to Ahaz and said, ask for a sign. Why would he do that? And the reason was because Israel was in a dire situation. We see in chapter 7, Ahaz is even having a difficult situation with his neighbors, with his friendly neighbors. By the time the king of Assyria became a great behemoth, you know, these little cities and these little countries like Syria, like northern Israel and Judah, they were weak. And so two neighboring countries, Syria and northern Israel, they were gathering together for the coalition, because they want to protect themselves from coming of Assyria. And so they come to the Ahaz, who was king of Judah. He was king of Jerusalem. And they said, hey, let's make a coalition. And so when Assyria comes, that we will be against together. Ahaz thought about it, and he said, you know what? I don't think that's a good idea. And at that moment, when the darkness was walking right into their land in face of Assyria, Ahaz has to make a decision whether he would trust the Lord or will trust the armies. And Isaiah comes to him and he said, look, always God is asking us and pleading with us to trust in him. Don't make an alliance with anybody, but trust in God. And you know what? Ask for a sign. Ask for a sign that God will be with you, that he will send Emmanuel, and the Emmanuel God is with us, and he will protect us from any armies. Isaiah thought about it. Uh, uh, Ahaz thought about it, and he said, you know what? We're fine. We don't need no sign. I have a better idea. I'm going to send people to king of Assyria, and I'm going to make alliance with him. And I will send some money and gold and silver that actually I will take from the temple. And he will protect me. And when he did that, these two neighboring countries, Syria and northern Israel, brothers, they said, we're going to go against you with the war. And at that moment, chapter 9 comes in. The year is about 733 B.C. Ahaz sent messenger to the tiglath pileser king of Assyria and said, I am your servant. And Vassal, come up and save me out of the land of the king of Aram and of the king of Israel who are attacking me. And that's exactly what happens. The king of Assyria came in and he destroys those two armies. That is a historical context. But you could see when God is speaking through Isaiah to Ahaz and to Israel, and it specifically mentions two tribes here. What are the tribes? Zebulun and Naphtali. And you know where they're located? They're located at the northern side of Israel. They were a gateway for armies for Assyria or anybody from the north coming in. You cannot go to Judah unless you go through those two tribes. They were at the threshold of Israel. And that is why Isaiah says, people, verse 2, who walk in darkness, people, those who live in a dark land, there is hope for you. But you're looking not in the right places. You're looking from people. 
Hope comes from God. These people live in the darkness. Look back, go back to chapter 9, but go in chapter 8, verses 22, 21 and 22, and you'll see that the darkness that is caused here is because of their sins, but the darkness is not their sins. The darkness that is sent to them and they're sent in the darkness is the doing of the Lord. Verse 21 in chapter 8, they will pass through the land, hard-pressed and famished, and it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as their face upward. They, then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. God said, when you turn your face from me and you look for other saviors, I'm going to send you into darkness. Now, it is caused by your sin. It is caused by your guilt before me. It is caused by your adultery. But the darkness that he's talking about is the darkness of the upcoming judgment. That is the darkness. These people in the Zebulun and in Naphtali are sitting and living in anticipation of nothing else but the severe, dark judgment. The day of the Lord sometimes we say that Joel says in 2 2, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of cloud and thick of darkness. But more precisely, when they live in a darkness or they walk in a darkness, it means that they live in the shadow of death. You know this familiar phrase, Psalm 23, right? Even if I walk through the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. We often use it at the funeral, right? When somebody is experiencing some kind of trouble or sickness or some, some hardship, we say, well, maybe you walk in through the valley of shadow of death. But specific application, specific interpretation in this context, in the context of Psalm 23, it's a military conquest. It's when in the valley, and you know where the battle happens? Usually in the valley. In Galilee, there's a valley of Je Jezreel, usually there. The battle, it happens. And when this two army comes in, and the armies of the invaders are so great that they're cast in shadow, and you're right there living in the shadow of death, all you have to anticipate in this battle is that you're going to die. That's the shadow of death. The three people of Galilee, at that time, because of their sin and unbelief to God, God said, I'm going to send you into the shadow of death. You will anticipate, instead of hope, hopelessness. Now, but you say, how is it encouraging to Israel? How is it encouraging to Israel? And he said, look, even the situation is so grievous. Verse 2, to the people who walk in darkness, what do I promise them? Light. We see, we'll see a great light. The light will shine upon them. That's the promise. When you are struggling in your life, look up to God. I like how Thomas, Tony Evans said, it is during the time of hopelessness that you are best positioned for kingdom encounter. This is where you mostly need him. This is where your eyes are open to seek for nowhere else but hope from God. And God promises them. Look, no matter how sinful you are, no matter how dreadful your situation, no matter how gloomy and anguish your soul is, no matter how close the death is and the conquest of Israel, I promise you something that will shine the light upon you. People who walk in the darkness will see great light. Now, what is the light? What is the light that they're anticipating to see? Is this just a flashlight, a sunlight? The light in the Bible is the promise of God. It is the word of God. That is the light. Remember, in Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is what? A lamp unto 
my feet and the light unto my path. What, why the word of God is light? It's not because it just explains us how to live, but it because it's promising us the light at the end of the tunnel when there is suffering and darkness that there is promise God will save you no matter what. Therefore, the most revealed promise of all promises in the Bible was revealed in the light of the light, Jesus Christ. When he came, he said, I am the light. I am the light of the world. Why? Because I'm shining and explaining the promises and the character of God to you. Follow me. Follow this light. Now, these Israelites, they had no clue about Jesus coming. They had no idea. They have no idea that Jesus would associate himself with the Son of God and say, I am this light. And yet, the meaning of the light here does not change. Because as for them, there was promise to trust in the Lord. That he will save you without any explanation of how he will do it. And they would have to just Trust him. In the same way, since we know that Christ is the light and he brings the promises of God, and this is how he done it, by pain on the cro- cross for our sins and resurrected for our justification, we have to also trust in the light. But more specifically in this text, it says the people who would walk in the darkness is those people in Zebulun and Naphtali. They were under attack and they will see the light. It says in the beginning, but there will be no more gloom for those who live in anguish. Now let me ask you a question. Have Israel received this promise? Have those people who live at the time of Isaiah, have they received this promise? Have they seen the king? Have they seen the light? They haven't. The prophecy has not been fulfilled. And though yet we have the precourse and the foreshadow in Jesus when he came the first time. And then when Matthew said that they saw a light. What did they do with the light? They rejected it. And with that, the whole promise of kingdom has gone for a time. God said, you will see the light. God said to those who are under oppression, you, I will give you a great joy, chapter 9, verse 3. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase in their gladness. They will be glad in your presence. And with the gladness of harvest, the men rejoice when they divide the spoil. See, the, there's four times in the one verse he alluded to joy. He said, in this situation, when it's so dark and gloomy and you're about to die, I'll promise you that you will be rejoicing. I promise you. That you will experience gladness, joy, to the extreme. To the extreme. And that's what Israel is anticipating. That they will be multiplied as a nation. You see verse 3, you shall multiply the nation. And it's not nations. Now we could spiritualize it and say, oh, the gospel brought the good news and the joy to all the nations. And now all the nations, there's a multiplication. And we replace Israel now. And we are a new generation of God's people. And, and we are. But we don't replace the Israel. God is not finished with Israel. He said, Israel, I will multiply you as a nation. I will multiply you as a nation. And as I multiply you, you will experience grace, joy. God did not replace Israel with the church. In fact, you will not find almost any reference to the church in Isaiah. It's like almost Isaiah skips the whole church age. He looks at the anguish and he said, God promises you Messiah. And then Messiah will come as a baby. And then he skips from the birth right to his Rain. Now, Isaiah doesn't know. 
We do know, but this is the promise that this Messiah who came the first time, he will come the second time. And it says, you shall multiply the nation and it shall increase their gladness and they will be glad where? In your presence. In your presence. Now, three times up to this moment, the name Emmanuel mentioned that. What does Emmanuel mean? God is with us. God is with us. When do you need God with you? Especially when you are in trouble. God is with you. God is speaking to Israel when they are in trouble. He said, I am with you. No matter how much you sin against me, I will be with you. There's a promise to the oppressed people. He will send the Savior who will live among them. Now, did they experience a little bit that when Jesus came and he said his name would be Emmanuel? Yes, and Jesus lived with his disciples for 30 years. And then he went up. And although we have the spirit of Jesus today, we don't have him in the physical body. He is not with us in the fullness of the sense. The promise is still to be completed and to finish. That God will dwell with us in a bodily form. Yesterday, we discussed it with my daughter, and she was ask, asking, tell me, Dad, that have anybody saw God? No, really, really, have anybody saw God? How can we see God? And I said, we can't. We can't see God unless in the bodily form. You have not seen God, but we will see the face of Jesus in the bodily form when he comes back to reign for a thousand years and then forevermore. We will be with him and he will be with us. Oh, what the joy would be to experience that presence of your Savior. Oh, what the joy would be for Israel when they're oppressed nation, they would actually see their king and they will be at the center of the world for a thousand years. They will be in charge of the world. From the beginning, Israel was promised the land, the kingdom, and the presence of God. And yet none of this happened yet. For more than 2,000 years, they have tried to reign and regain the kingdom. In 1948, a new kingdom of Israel have started. But there's no kingdom of God in it. This is not the Israel that Isaiah was talking. This is not the kingdom of God that was promised to them. This is a man-made kingdom. But when the Messiah comes, he will flip the world upside down where Israel would be at the center of the world. Today, Israel fights with missiles and tanks. But then Israel will not fight. He will not fight. He will trust the Lord and the Lord will fight for him. There will be great gladness. It says verse 4 here that what kind of gladness would be? That gladness as if you have great harvest or that you rejoice that you got great spoil. That's the gladness. Have you seen people rejoicing and dancing and kissing and screaming from joy from the cliffs when the World War II ended? Have you seen those? Why did they do that? Why were they so happy? You know what they gained? They gained peace. Peace. They lost Everything, most of them lost all things, but they gained one thing. They gained peace. Israel will be joyful, happy. They will be liberated. That verse 4 says, you shall break the yoke of their burden, the staff of the shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. It will be real liberation, liberation. All of their lives, they live like slaves. And They did it because they were evil and sinful. And yet God said, I promise you that. And I promise you peace to those who are in war. Peace. I like how NIV translates verse 5. 
It's a little bit confusing in, 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 in NASB, but NIV, listen to this, verse 5. Every warrior boot used in a battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for fire. That means every soldier's ammunition and all every soldier's uniform will be burned up. Why? Because war is over. Nobody's fighting anymore. And it's done. Everything that you did in your blood and in your evil war, it will be come to an end. And we read it. This is going to be the end, as Alec read it. The end when Christ at the second coming and the white horse would wipe everyone out. And that would be the peace forever. Now, can we say that this promise has been fulfilled for Israel? If we be honest to the text, we can't say that it was. Yes, Jesus coming and his birth was associated with a great joy when angels singing for joy. Yes, the resurrection was associated with a great joy when people believe the Messiah. But it will be final, completed, fulfillment when the Messiah returns and ransom captive Israel. I like how commentator Bine comments on this, these verses. He says, the events described in this passage have never been fulfilled in nation yet. The destruction has not been canceled yet. They still live in the darkness awaiting of judgment. As you think about this, if there's hope for Israel, there's hope for us. And here's what hope is. Trust in God's plan. Meaning trusting in his timing. In his purpose for our life. It means surrendering our own plans. Our own desires to him. Believing that his ways are higher than our ways. And when we trust in God's plan. We could find peace in the midst of uncertainty. Trust in God's promise. No matter how unbelievable that promise is, no matter that you have not received it yet, it is coming. Christ is coming. The second thing that I want to mention in verses 6 to 7 is this. No matter how absurd and how ridiculous and how foolish God's plan may seem to us, trust in God's wisdom. You know, we all have plans for ourselves. I'm sure Israel had a plan. You have a plan for yourself. Some of you are planning really well, so you're already sitting here and planning what you're going to do tomorrow yeah. or next week or planning your future or your retirement. We hope and pray, as I said, for the things to go well with us for us. No one is planning to get sick, Right? No one is planning to become bankrupt tomorrow. But how realistic our plans are, what are they based on? On your performance and what you did? Are you wisdom? We can't be sure anything of this life, no matter how much we pray, no matter how much we desire to be well on this earth. And we pray often, Lord, please let me be healthy Lord, please protect my family, and so on, and that's all good. But there's one sure hope that God's wisdom, and he has a plan in detail how to save his people. And that is for sure. He's our hope. Anything else is just hope so. So let's look at God's method of salvation that is warranted by God himself in verses 6 to 7. Now I mentioned that no matter how absurd God's method is of saving people, we should trust it. We should trust it. God's method of salvation must be embraced by faith. We should believe God. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 19, we have these familiar verses. For the world of the cro- word of the cross is what? Foolishness to those who are perishing. 
God said, I'm going to save you this way. And they said, well, that is just stupidity. That, that doesn't make any sense. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. And the reason I bring this up, because in verse 4, verse 4, he mentions this phrase. For you shall break the yoke of the burden and the staff of the shoulders, on the shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. And then he gave an illustration. He said, as at the battle of Midian. As at the battle of Midian. And the battle of Midian shows how ridiculous God's plan is to human eyes. How ridiculous God's plan is. Remember that the, the battle of Midian, it's uh, Judges chapter 6 and 7, when... Gideon, for a second, I forgot his name, Gideon. Gideon was chosen to be the savior for Israel. But he was such a pathetic savior. He was doubting everything. He was doubting God. God has to convince him that I am going to be with you. Don't worry. I will save through you. And he said, if you save through me, do this and do this and do this. And God went and did it. But then he sent him to fight an army. And here's the description of the army that he's fighting is. An enemy is described, Midian's enemy. It was thick as a locust. You know, locust? With camels. As countless as the sand of the sh- on the seashore. <laughs> They're camped. You know where they camped? In the land of Naphtali in Zebulun and Asher. In the northern, northern part of Israel. It's where Isaiah is talking about to them. He said, remember that time, how God saved you? And before they enter in the battle, God said, look, you collected 32,000 men. That is way too much. Let's do some tests and let's pick those who drink like a dog. And there will be 300 of them and I will fight through them. Now imagine this. You're Gideon. You have at least 100,000 of people, warriors. They're already occupying the land. They're chilling. And you're sitting in this darkness. And God said, I'm going to save it. This Israel through you and it will overcome this army. And you will say, well, give me the plan. What is the plan, Lord? Are you going to give us machetes? Or are you going to give us what? Bazookas? You're going to give us... Some automatic weapon, tanks, what are you going to give us? Some, some kind of bomb, what, what are you going to give us? And God said, no, I'm going to downsize you to 300 men. And I don't care whether those 300 men would be ninjas or they'd be strong like Schwarzenegger or quick like Bruce Lee. I, I don't care because they're just 300 men against 100,000 arms. And then he said, what weapon are we going to use, Lord? And he said, well, there will be no weapon. There would be a torch, a candle, and a pitcher. And I would sit and think, Lord, do you want me to burn them with a candle and hit them with a pitcher? Like how in the world, how ridiculous that looks, that God will save us through these means. And yet God does. And yet God does. Using some unusual tactics God prom- God leading them to use one weapon. And you know what the weapon is that conquer all of it is their faith in the promise and the plan of God. That's the weapon. Friends, you have no weapon. You have nothing in your arsenal Except faith in God. And when you have faith in God, you have hosts of Lord's army battling for you. Where is the strength of Gideon? By simply trusting the Lord. He said, okay, okay. I guess we will win. I guess that's the best plan we have. Like, I could have come up with a plan, but we'll go with your plan. 
which is going to go with the candle and, and, and the pitcher. And we'll smash them and see what happens. And we know what happened. Psalm 33 says, the king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory. Nor does the deliverer, he deliver anyone by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on the, those who fear him. And those who hope for his loving kindness to deliver their soul from death. God is sovereign over war. And our battle is done by faith, knowing that God has plan for us. We could bring some more examples. Remember uh, Naaman. There was a Syrian general. How was he saved from leprosy? How ridiculous it looked to him to just go and dip in the muddy water of, of Jordan. What is that? But the faith has saved God's method of salvation is sometimes doesn't make any sense to us, but we trust, and I'm sure it didn't make any sense to them. I'm sure it made any sense to them because imagine this, this darkness and upcoming of army. By the way, in about a few years, Assyria will wipe completely northern kingdom of Israel. And Judah would remain as a small patch of people. And Assyria will bring some Babylonians into the region. And then we see it as Samaria now. And in that time, God tells them, look how I'm going to save you. Verse 6. You see the context? Verse 6. He said, for a child will be born to us. And you have to stop and scratch your head. Lord, the war is here. How a child could help us in this matter? Now, perhaps he would grow up and become a mighty man. Perhaps. But we need help now. God said, I have a plan. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given. For, verse 6, for, it's the reason. It's the reason how and why I'm go are you going to be saved. The reason is this child. God surprises the expectations of those who hope in God. He saves us through his son. And of course here in this phrase, though, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. You could see two aspects. A child is in line of David. He would be human. And a son, the son not of David, but the son of God will be given to us. There's a humanity and there's deity. The son, a child will be born to us. It's his incarnation. It's when he was born. But that's all that it happened yet. This is all what it happened. Nothing else in these verses really fulfilled. It's all in future and future and hope of Israel. And a son will be given to us. This word given is a gift or he would be set in a land. And, and Isaiah does not have in mind John 3.16 here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that he will save the world. Is that what he's talking about? He skips the whole cross thing and he goes to the end and he said, the son, the son of God will be given to us as what? As who? It says, and the government will rest on his shoulder. That's where he goes, to the second coming. First and second coming in one verse. He looks further than the cross. He goes beyond to where the just and merciful ruler king is the gift for us. I'm sure you're thinking about your government as a gift to you, right? You're happy. Oh, they will be happy of the true government who will rule over them. We have the temptation that since 
child is born, Christ is ruling now. And, and to some extent, yes, he's ruling in your heart, but he's not in the bodily form here. He's not seated in the throne of Jerusalem. He's not on the throne of David. He is not making the decree. He is not sending his army. He's not yet. It will happen. It will happen. Why would we wait for that? Because I want to be ruled by my Lord. And you know what? At that time, I will be resurrected. At that time, all the troubles of the world and all the sicknesses and all the sin that lives in me will be done away with and I will be in the presence of the Holy Messiah serving him in a new body. I'm looking to the hope of Israel because I will be resurrected at that time. I'm looking for this new type of leadership that will lead me not astray into sin, into depression, but into the joy and peace and a realized hope. That's what we're looking for. When he'll abolish all things and abolish death and will sit as a ruler. A few descriptions of this era and of this time, but are specifically of Christ, of this Emmanuel. He says this, that he will be a wonderful counselor. Wonderful means not just like, oh, amazing. It's not like you come into a counselor to a pastor and he's like, has some kind of wisdom to tell you how to live. It would be a godlike wonder. It's a supernatural wisdom that he possesses. He's counselor and relates to his govern, government. When the government will be on his shoulders and he will govern the world with wisdom. Not just a suggestion and just cute little things that you read and, and see on TikTok. Like, whoa, that's a good quote. He will be ruling with, with an, an insight. He would guide us with the leadership, the concept that we would understand. You know, right now we're like kids. We trust God. Sometimes my kids asking me, why should I do that? Why should I do this math problem? Why, why do I need it? How does it help me in me? How would I use it in life? And after some explanation, I tell them, well, just you're going to do it. Why? Because I said so. That's it. The end of discussion, because I said so. You don't know all the wisdom. You don't know how it may or may not help you. Just do it and trust me and do it. In the same way, we're doing what God asking us today, walking in holiness, walking in faith. By faith, we're just walking according to his wisdom without clearly understanding how and why. You know, we should do that sometimes. We, we're in depression. Like, why have you brought this thing in my life? Like, why did it happen to me? Why now? All this why question is just a lack of our understanding of God's plan, right? But by then, he will explain it to us by wise counsel. And he will say, well, this is why we're doing this. And it would be clearly that we will understand that at that time. Christ would guide us. Christ would guide Israel. It says that he's mighty God. It's not that he has all the plan and wisdom, but he has the power to accomplish it. He's a mighty God, the power of accomplishment. He is this God. Like ancient creed declares, he is very God of very God. He's very God of very God. It could never be said about any human being. Right? He's a stronger, powerful warrior. And again, this is all in the context of military power. He will rule. And every king has army. And Christ has all at his disposal, all the power. He says everlasting father. There's no confusion here whether he is father, the first person of the Trinity. No, he is the father of eternity. He is that kind of father that will be there always. The other day we had a discussion with my little one again uh, about the death. Sometimes it pops up and say, well, well what, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm going to die, right? I'm, I'm 50 years old. So the more than half life passed, for sure. 
And she would say, well, that's sad. I don't want that to happen. I said, well, I'm your father now, but I can't hold to that title. At some point, I'll be gone. I'm not eternal father, but he is. He gave us the life by his spirit, and now he is eternal father. He's father always, forever, for eternity. How incredible that is. Christ is our father forever. And then he mentions that he is prince of peace. Prince of peace. Means captain that secures spiritual peace and tranquility forever. Throughout the history, we see many attempts to do peace. We know of Roman peace. Right? We know now of Russian peace, right? of American peace. We try to push the peace. And all we have is calamity. But there would be one who will bring it, everything to conclusion and peace. There will be no end to increase of his government or of peace. One on the thr thr throne of David and over his kingdom, he will rule with justice and righteousness. And he ends with this, the guarantee of what he just said. This all will happen to Israel for sure, 100%. You know why? Look with me, 7 the last phrase. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish it. <laughs> God loves his son. He's zealous for him. And he's zealous for everyone who believes in him. And he will do that. Nothing will stop it. Whatever he starts with, with Israel, he will finish. Whatever he started with you, he will finish it. And the culmination of your hope, a true hope, true hope that you are truly in your regenerated heart looking for, it's not to have a better life here. It's not to be relieved from oppression and sin and depression, but it's to be in the presence of this Emmanuel, that God is with us. Finish with the short story. One evening in the dark war days of 1940, World War II was right in its uprise. When all the Europe, almost all Europe was in some kind of battle and war, the former prime minister, Anthony Eden, had to resign in 1938. And the Winston Churchill were dining together. And they were sitting debating which period of history is preferred to live in. And Eden said, well, I prefer Napoleon era and General Pitt we had a great victory over there. And Churchill favored age of Queen Anne, Annie. And then Churchill said this. Of course, of all times, this is the greatest time to live in. I mean, in the midst of war. This is the one in which to love. And then he said this. Nevertheless, as one of our poets said, the best is yet to come. Earth's finest age lies not in the past, but in the future. The millennial age in which Jesus Christ will personally preside over the affairs of this planet. In wondrous thought, every true-born child of God will be alive on earth at that time. We're looking for that. Father, we thank you for your kindness that we see that you're faithful to Israel, that your zeal will accomplish that. All that you promise, and no detail 
will, give, will go un, unfu, unfulfilled. You will bring your son to rule. It is your world. And however sinful Israel is and corrupt, you will save it. And the remnant of Israel, the one-third, as uh, Zechariah said, will be saved. The small portion, and yet they will receive the hope of Israel in the name of Christ. Praise you for everything that you've done through him. Amen.